This is Gabnet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, hey it's Alex, this is the Rambo and we go until midnight tonight from the East Coast to the United States in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who's going to tell me when I need to retire, Larry Bubbles Brown. You're gonna, hey. be, you're gonna, you're gonna listen to me, and if I sound like uh, I'm going, because see, I see all these people on television, like Andrea Mitchell. You know who she is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she's getting too old to be on the air. She just, she stutters and flumfers and bloom, and and she's, she's really, uh, you know. And I, don't, I don't want to get after her because she's old, but I think as an old person, you know, it's kind of like how black people can use the N word with other black people. Mm-hmm. Well, I think if I'm as old as I am, which is 82, I can go after Andrea Mitchell if I feel she's losing it, right? And how how old would she be? I think she's in her... Well, let me find out. I go to the authority. Um, Echo, how old is Andrea Mitchell? Andrea Mitchell is 75 years old. Okay, there we go. See? Everything, I, everything you need to know, my little friend here will tell us. You know, um, let's see if they know who you are. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> e- Echo, Echo, how old is Larry Bubbles Brown? Larry Brown is eighty-one years old. Well, that's wrong. Uh, eighty-one. <laughs> you're eighty-one. Oh, that's the. Uh, there's a foot. There's a basketball coach. There was a writer named Larry Brown. Uh huh. There's a lot of Larry Browns. Yeah. Uh, but talk about, uh, you know who's the big controversy about getting old out here? They think she's losing it as uh, Senator Feinstein. Well, she's 88, for crying out loud. Exactly. But uh, and, and what is she doing still being a senator? You know what I'm saying? Well, there's talk about she should leave. So. Well, I mean, I think she should talk about leaving. I mean, you know, she's had a good run, for crying out loud. You know. I mean, um, she's gone out and she's fought big for gun control, which I don't understand why, because she'd never be a senator if, it were, <laughs> if guns were controlled. Um, Remember Steve Pearl's line about she, she wasn't elected mayor. It was more like, bang, bang, who's next? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can make that joke now. Back then... They wouldn't have thought it was so funny. Not in 78. It was not funny then, no. Yeah. Uh, that was Mayor Moscone. And Harvey Milk, yeah. And Harvey Milk, yeah. That, that was, was uh, right after, that was like about the same week that Jonestown had happened. It was a wild month in San Francisco. Really? Yeah. I didn't realize the two incidences were that close to each other, but I wasn't oh, like a week I, week apart. I think yeah, that was a period of time where I wasn't living in San Francisco. Um, you know what I missed because I was living in in uh, in Houston and then Chicago and ultimately New York. And during that whole time, the whole hate Ashbury thing was happening in San Francisco, and so I missed out on all that. Yeah, but you weren't there for that, were you? No, I was. Yeah. that, but I was what? here for the uh, um, Moscone assassination and uh, yeah, and Jonestown. But uh, you, you you were you were you were, you were born in Michigan, right? Ohio, Ohio, rather in Ohio, same thing. Same uh, thing. <laughs> right next to each other. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, you, you go over the state line, you don't notice the difference. Okay, anyway. Um, but how long did you live there before you left there, and did you go directly to San Francisco? I, I was uh, going to college for a couple of years. Then my parents had retired, and my sister lived in, she moved to San Francisco. And uh, they came out here and visited, and they said, we got to get out of Ohio. <laughs> so so yeah. they moved, and I just thought, oh, I might as well go along with them. So. And so where did they go? They moved to 
San Francisco down on uh, Franklin Street. Oh, really? And how old were you at that point? I was like uh, 19. Oh, okay. So you were all, so, so when did you first decide to be a comedian? Uh, something I always dreamed about, but I didn't know how you did it. And then, um, what did I, oh, I first heard, uh, oh, there's a, there was an open mic at the Punchline in San Francisco on Sunday nights. So I went down to watch that, and that's how I got into it. So you just decided to try open mic? Yeah, at first I just went down to, I watched for a year, and, uh, mm-hmm. I was shocked at how good some of the comics were here then. It was the uh, first night I went down, I saw Jeremy Kramer and Michael Pritchard and uh, Dana Carvey. Wow. That's quite a lineup. So so, yeah. so you finally went on the first time. Do you remember the first joke, the first time you went on stage? March 3rd, 81. It was a Tuesday. As we, As you know, Bubbles remembers everything about his life. Okay, so what was the first joke? My first joke was I almost didn't make it here tonight. I was in a freak accident. I ran over a dwarf. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> not bad for your first joke, I didn't think. And I, I remember it got a, uh, there was like a long pause and the crowd started laughing. I thought, oh, shit. So, so I actually got, I got some laughs my first time. How did that feel? It was just, it was so, uh, I was glad I got some laughs, but I mean, just the whole experience was terrifying. Because I have likened, and and, you know, I've done some stage work in that I hosted a lot of the comedy shows that we did, and I imagine, I came up with some material, Uh, but I I never considered myself a stand-up comic, but when I would get the audience to get a big laugh, I got a big laugh out of an audience, it was the same thing as making a woman come. (laughs) <laughs> That's a great feeling, right? Well, isn't it the same thing? Yeah, you're giving, I mean, you're it, giving pleasure to someone. What I always enjoyed about sex was not the, the joy it gave me, but the fact that I could elicit a response from another human being by my actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That is always what I enjoyed most about sex. If a woman really started coming and whatever and oh God, that, that that just really was my thing so you're a I, giver you're a giver most men are takers so the first time i got up in front of an audience and they they um uh, they laughed uh it was all i could do to keep from blowing my wad <laughs> you know what i'm saying in other words i suddenly realized it was the same thing because i was controlling an emotion of another human being so it's a control thing. It's a control thing. Oh, no no doubt about it, you know. I mean, but, uh, uh, I mean, I, ne- I never told jokes in bed because I didn't want the woman to laugh. I wanted a different emotion out of her. But really what we do is we have a tendency to, to want to elicit a, uh, a response out of somebody. And to make somebody laugh is to, to elicit from them something that is very special. So, you know. Yeah, Jerry Seinfeld once said a lot of stand-up comedy is just uh, crowd control. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's perfect. Listen, I did, I, it's been a couple of weeks by the time this runs, uh, but I just wanted to ask you do, you, do you have any reflections on the death of Gilbert Gottfried? Uh, yeah, I love Gilbert, yeah. I, just, I, was, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know he'd been sick, so... Did you you did you ever meet up with him when he was in San Francisco? He, I met, you know where I met him. Uh, I I was doing Montreal and you were doing you, you came out to Montreal to do the show Live One Hundred and Five and uh, you had Gilbert on and you had me on the same day. Did I have Gilbert on? Yeah. See, I don't remember anything about that trip to Montreal. And you might think, well, what kind of drugs were you on, Bennett? And I'll tell you what kind of drug I was on: a very heavy narcotic for pain. Because just before going there, about five days before going there, I pinched a nerve in my back. Now, I had never done that in my life, but... Oh, that's horrible. Excruciating pain. You can't lie anyway. Uh, so, so what they give you, uh, besides they were doing physical therapy on me, but what they did was they gave me some medicine. So I got to Montreal, and I was in just 
excruciating pain through that whole couple of days. You probably didn't notice it because I, you know, I hide it pretty well when I'm performing. And uh, I, I don't remember a thing about that. Really? I really don't. All I remember. Well, you had me and Gilbert on, and you know, you, all you had on was uh, Brandon Tartikoff. Did I really? Yeah. See, I don't remember any of it. Don't remember any of it. Is that strange? Yeah. You know, uh, I do. Uh, you know, I remember I went up there, and I remember I spent most of my time when I wasn't on the air in a hotel room, lying on my back to try and ease the pain. Uh, and it was just, it was horrible, just horrible. But I made it through the. Yeah, that was such a that was such a big festival. And I, still going, I guess. But uh, back but, then, it was huge. But if you say Brandon Tartikoff was there, and if you say that who else was there, I think wasn't was was um, Ed McMahon on my on those shows. I, that I don't remember. I was up there for two or th- I think I was up there for two days. I don't know yeah. how long you were up there. And uh, I think we were there for two or three days. Yeah, I was hanging. I was hanging out with Rich Hall from Saturday Night Live. He was a great guy. Yeah, yeah. And it was a fun time. Whatever happened to Rich Rich Hall? I think he bought a. He had that Sniglet book. He made some money. I know he bought a ranch in Montana, and then he was doing a lot of work in England. But uh, really, yeah, he was kind of one of those because he, he that, was doing uh, pretty well there for a while you know he had the, as he you was. say he had the there s- are a lot of people that don't like uh a lot of people don't like being famous so they kind of uh, make money and disappear so. well you know there was a guy years ago people don't remember this uh because you're all too young for this do you remember a guy by the name of Kay kaiser uh i've heard the name it's uh, like a he was a band leader or something yeah, in the he was a band leader at a band uh Kay Kaiser, and uh, he uh, had a radio show, uh, Kay Kaiser's uh, College of Musical Knowledge. Uh, and uh, he did, did quite a few movies and so on and so forth. My father always told me that Kay Kaiser had a, a, a something he said, that uh, I'm out to make a million dollars, and once I make a million dollars, I'm going to retire. He made his millionth dollar. Guess what? <laughs> he did it. <laughs> he retired. You know, a lot of actors, believe it or not, in the old days, you wonder, well, what happened to so-and-so? What happened to so-and-so? Jimmy Cagney worked till he was 65, and then he retired. He said, you retire when you're 65, and he retired. Mm. That was it, you know. Uh, Not a bad idea, really. I mean, after years of a lot of work, if you've got enough money, why not retire? Enjoy the rest of your life. Enjoy your old age, you know. Or you can be like Clint Eastwood and work when you're in your 90s. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I saw a thing of him at the Academy Awards with uh, Billy Crystal sitting on his lap. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at him and going, you know, he was a young man once. You know, th- I mean, he did, didn't, the Clint Eastwood of today is much craggier than the old Clint Eastwood. Yeah. So it was really, uh, really amazing. But he's, st- he's still directing. You know he is. He's ninety-one. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't. I, I don't know. You know, it's such, it's such a stressful job directing. It's such a physical job, and people don't think of a director as being physical. But he's got to be here, and he's got to be there, and he's got to be directing this person and moving to this person. And uh, you just begin to wonder, how's he doing it? You know, at my age, I don't think I could direct the film. It, it's exhausting. I, would, I would think the directing would require such intense concentration and making sure everything is going right. I, there's a lot to watch, and I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't, I don't know how he does it. You know, and um, another actor who's uh, still directing, although he's not being allowed to as much, is Woody Allen. Um, yeah, was he canceled? Is he still working? <laughs> well, it's harder for him to get the money and harder for him to get the actors to work with him, and all because of false accusations. That really sucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely false accusations. No, no, none of the accusations against Woody Allen have ever been proven, and there are people who refuse to work with him because they believe the accusations. I know. And you go, come on, you know? You really, you really feel that way? 
I, I, uh, I but, um, uh, and I think it's terrible because I think he's a really good director, and I li- I look forward to whatever he does, even if it's not good. You know, even bad Woody Allen is better than most people. True. But, uh, uh, but you know, I mean, uh, we we talk about existing in this age of uh, Me Too, of wokeness, I guess is what they call it now, and it's just it's just terrible. I mean, uh, who's got an act anymore? I mean, you deal, you talk to comedians. Are they afraid of what material they're doing? Oh, they've definitely. Uh, I'd say uh, turn things back. They don't. Uh, I don't think they talk as freely as they used to. Yeah, yeah. We were talking the other day about uh, a bunch of us uh, who get together on Saturday nights on Zoom and just talk back and forth with each other. It's nothing. It's broadcast or anything like that. And we were talking about all this wokeness and everything. And they were saying one of the one of the people said that he was told in a sensitivity training session that you can't as a boss you can't walk into a room with a bunch of the people who work for you and say okay guys let's get going (laughs) that's too harsh (laughs) guys you can't use the term guys now to me guys meant a bunch of people okay it never meant a bunch of men right Mm -hmm. can't say that anymore wow you know, and I'm going. Everybody's afraid to say anything. They're afraid of what they tweeted ten years ago. And then they remember there weren't tweets back then. But you know, but it, it's just it's really it's um, it's sad. And I then think about my friends, the comedians, and how's it affecting their careers? How's it affecting the material they choose to do? And unfortunately, no such thing. So did you did you uh, ever meet Gilbert when he came and did my show in San Francisco? Do you remember that? Uh, no, I just remember meeting him in Montreal. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. When I was a young comic, I remember Robin Williams had been to New York, and he came back, and he was talking to a bunch of us, and he oh, I saw this great comic in New York, and it turned out he was talking about Gilbert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gilbert uh, Gilbert's been around forever, and he's been successful but not in the normal success thing you know I mean when you think about it you go well what has he done and then you start listing what he's done and you go he's really been working rather consistently for the last what 30 years 40 years yeah uh, and um, then you, you you think about it and you go yeah but he wasn't one of those people that everybody knew who he was All right you know, you say Robin Williams, everybody knows Robin Williams. You know, um, you say any number of names and they're immediately recognizable. But Gilbert Gottfried, then you play the voice, of course, and they know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, briefly on Saturday Night Live in 1980, he did a few episodes. No, he was there for the first 13 weeks of the second of the. Um, of the what? What season was it? The, the, the season after uh, all the the initial Baluki people left. and Chevy Chase and everybody was gone. Yeah, they had the nineteen eighty. It was horrible. They almost canceled the show. It was. Uh, yeah, it was a woman by the name of Jane uh, Jean Jean, Dumain- Jean Dumanian. Yeah, uh, she later became a producer for Woody Allen, but she oh, okay. she she brought that show together, and it was just ghastly. Train wreck. Yeah. But you know what the problem with that year, that year was? I mean, if you go back and look at it, it's not that terrible. They got some great people on that show. I mean, you had Gilbert, and you had uh, Piscopo, I think, was in that group, and a few people they left over. Uh, uh, actually, Eddie Murphy came out of that group, but he was like, a, you know how they have the, the names of the not ready for prime time players, and then they say, with, and then they got yeah. all these other comments. He was one of those. But, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible show. What it was is kind of like... Uh, uh, Larry Bubbles Brown have to, ha- having to go on right after Robin Williams. <laughs> I mean, of course you're going to stink. You know, you can't win. No. Uh, the, the people have gotten used to a certain kind of, of comedy. So that year when everybody left and a whole new bunch were in there, nobody wanted to accept that. You know, they were overly critical of it. They didn't let these people develop. And... Uh, I, if it had lasted, 
and those people had survived, I think Gilbert's career would have been different. You know, uh, it, it it but it was a it was a it was a badly conceived of solution to the problem, as it were. But uh, so well, I'm glad you got to meet Gilbert. He was a great guy. I loved Gilbert. He was great, and he did, he did. He would. He was not afraid to offend anyone. No, he uh, he, he sabotaged his career on many an occasion. Yeah, many times. You know, and still survived by just keeping on going. You know, you t- what was the joke he did like a couple of weeks after nine eleven about? Oh well, he was at uh, there was a U Hefner roast on Comedy Central, and uh, he got up and he said. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to catch a flight these days. He said, I finally did catch a flight to get me here. Stop. It was planning to be stopped at the Empire State Building <laughs> or something like that. I mean, and this is like two days after 9-11, he tells this joke. I think it was Bill Maher in an interview who said, Gilbert was the king of too soon. <laughs> And then what was the other? There was one other that got him in a lot of the one. Something got him in trouble with Aflac, and they fired him. He lost. Yeah, I think he was making a half million dollars just for doing that voice. But he it was the uh, there was a tsunami in Japan, and Aflac had a lot of yes, and he made a joke about that fan or something, and uh, it was a tweet actually is what it was. And then there's one other thing he did that got him in a lot of trouble too, and he lost work out of it. I mean, he just was, the, he was, he was the king of too soon. Because he didn't have that, that sensor that you probably have in you that goes, well, let me, I better not do that, you know. The filter. <laughs> the filter. He didn't have the filter. To him, funny was funny. And, and it, what was really funny to him, and it should be, was tragedy. Because if you laugh at tragedy, you soften the blow of the tragedy. And I think he believed that tragedy was was a good place to go for comedy. But uh, he made me laugh really hard. I'll tell you, I talk about this every year. Uh, We would go to a party, the same party, at a friend's house. And he and I would get together and go off into a corner and talk for two hours. You know, and I enjoyed his company, and I think he enjoyed mine. And that was our basic socialization at that point. Uh, you know, and he had done my show on any number of occasions, but it wasn't like he was a regular. I was in San Francisco, and he was in New York. But whenever he came to San Francisco, he did the show. So, but anyway, you know, I mean, we've lost a couple of good com, nice couple of nice comics this year. We God, we've lost Norm and Louis Anderson and uh, Bob Saget. Yeah, well, for me, it's Bob Saget and and, and Gilbert. Um, you know, I didn't know Louis Anderson, and I didn't know who was the other one you mentioned. Uh, Norm Macdonald. Norm Macdonald. I didn't. I didn't know Norm Macdonald, although no, I, I thought you didn't have him on the show. I don't think so. You know, it's funny. I did so many shows with so many different people. Every now and then, somebody would come on and go. Like it was Louis Black a few years ago came on my show at Sirius XM, and he said, "You know, I've done your show before." I said, "Where?" He said, "In San Francisco." He said, but you probably don't remember. I wasn't screaming then, you know. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I said, I hope I treated you well. He says, yeah, you treated me very nicely, you know. But I don't, I, uh, somehow I don't, you know, I don't remember uh, uh, some comics who came and went through, uh, you know. And every now and then I'll have some comic or some actor or somebody say, hey, remember when I did your show in San Francisco? And I go, was I doing coke at the time? <laughs> you know, I mean, what was it? I, a lot of them I never remembered because it was just this long list of people who would come in the door and go out the door. So, you know, but uh, I never, I, of course, I always remembered um, Gilbert. How can you not? You know, I always yeah, remember. Yeah, hard to forget. I always remember Larry Bubbles Brown. Well, I, and I, I hardly leave a footprint. So that's you, uh, you were on a few times, weren't you? I was on a few times. <laughs> I actually employed a few times. Yeah, well, yeah. He was our weather guy for <laughs> that traffic guy. The traffic guy. Uh, although that that was great. I loved you doing traffic. No, nobody better doing traffic. 
That's the way traffic. Fun, yeah. That's the way traffic should be done because it's insignificant anyway, you know. Uh, but it was nice to have a, a comedy break in the show whenever I went to traffic. Anyway, I hey, like, yes, <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> we have run out of another joyous. 25 yeah. minutes of, of, of... Time flies. Well, it's not... I love talking to you, you know? Yeah, I you really do. Man. And you get me talking, and it's a conversation, and uh, you're not fighting for space, you know? Anyway, uh, I love you. I think the world love of you. you. And we'll see you again in... Uh, oh, next week. How's that? Love you too, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Gavin. The Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Ah, yes, Larry Bubbles Brown. Yes, Larry, Larry, Larry. I just got a, um, um, a uh, Len LaFrisco, a guy who calls our Monday show, and he uh, sent me a thing tonight saying I'm going to go see a comedy show with uh, Larry Bubbles Brown tonight. So he then... Uh, went and he sent me a picture of he and Bubs together. And Bubs is looking good, man. He's like, what, 66, 67, something like that, I guess. And he's looking terrific. God, you know, and I, he should get himself a, a you know, uh, a camera and a thing so he can get on and we can do a show together uh, with us seeing him. But he says, oh, I'm just too hideous these days. No, he's not. He's looking great. But anyway, so. And then uh, uh, he, uh, Len wrote that uh, he said uh, the show was great and he killed. And I went, uh, well, how would we expect anything less of Bubbles? You know, Bubbles does kill. He is a very funny, funny comic. Anyway, it's time for us to go out to uh, various places, uh, one of which is, two of which are California, and one of which is, uh, I'm trying to remember now, is it... Uh, you know, I, I always forget, uh, Josh, exactly where you are. So please tell us where you are. I am in Ohio. That's what I figured, but I didn't want to be wrong. I'm technically in my basement. <laughs> well, this is from your basement, huh? This is, is this your man cave? It is my television room. Your television room. In my basement. Yeah. I see. Now, is does the wife come down and watch TV with you? Occasionally. Oh, you don't, why? You don't like the same shows or what? Um, a little bit. Um, but she, you know, watches a lot of her stuff in her upstairs office or whatever. We have a few things we watch together. There's not that much out there left anymore, you know. TV's getting kind of shitty. It is getting kind of crappy. You know what somebody suggested? Yeah. And it wouldn't be a bad idea if TV just went to pay TV. If all the networks just went to pay, to a pay format and, you know. Never know. Yeah, she she does watch some TV down here. Like, you know, sometimes we come down here and while we eat dinner, we watch a, a show and then kind of she goes back upstairs or whatever. Uh, Better Call Saul was back on for the last couple episodes or whatever. So yeah. We yeah. watch a little of bit course. of that. Of course. Hello to uh, to Alan. Where what happened to Kevin? Kevin was here for a second. He well, won't know. Maybe he gave up. I don't. <laughs> it could be. He was just he saw Alan and bolted. You know. <laughs> um, and um, how you doing, Alan? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, here comes Kevin now. Uh, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing okay. You know. Is it really your seventh season? I guess. What. I don't know, the, the intro, you said something about the seventh season. You haven't heard that before? I don't listen to the intro. It's only been running like that for the last year. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, congratulations on your eighth season. It's coming up. It's coming up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we got to get uh, Rob to do a new intro. So, you know, which every year I write him and I say, would you do another one for the new year? You know, so... Yeah, eight years of absolute futility. Yeah. It's kept a lot of us happy and sane. I guess the only reason I keep doing it is to keep you happy, Alan. Every morning Absolutely. I wake up and I think, what can I do for Alan? That's right. I try, try and find you all the items under a dollar that I can send you from Prime. I remember you did that once. It was very funny. 
Well, because we were, just, you know, in fact, the, I, I was remembering that because today I ordered something from Prime uh, and I ordered three of those small little batteries, those round batteries. And th for four of them, I think it was, uh, what, uh, six of them or something like that. It was like only $3.45. But I figured, what the hell? So I'm that. That's a good cheap one, right? Right. Although you Are found the batteries you, that you need, I hope you found stuff for under a buck, though, right? Yeah, yeah. A ruler. What else did I send you? Some uh, um, uh, a spray that I sent Mike Allen every time he farts to, so the wallpaper doesn't come. Yeah. Off well, the you wall. know something though. Uh, what they do to save money is they take that one order and they put them all in one box. Sure. See, and that's how they get away with that. But there's no way they're going to get off of having to send me, probably spend five bucks to send me $3 worth of whatever. They'll send, it, they'll send it like U.S. mail type thing. You know, it's coming here. It's taking longer than usual to get here. Yes, yes. But yeah. no, I got one of these, you know, these Air Tags that uh, Apple has, yeah, and it's work. gone dead on me. And I guess it's the battery. You know, after a year, they go out, so I have to put a new one in. I thought Can't, they were rechargeable. I thought you put it on the no, little... No, 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 no. no? Those oh. are not rechargeable. No. I don't know much about them. And getting the battery out is hell. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, he hello to Kevin. How are you doing, Kevin? Okay, how you doing, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey, Kevin. Gee, if we just had Patrick here, we'd be... This would be Saturday night. Mm-hmm. You know? Because um, every Saturday night, we kind of get together and... Just have a little private talk, you know. And uh, uh, it's always one night you guys went. I had to beg out because I was dog tired. I was just like I didn't think I could go more than about an hour, and I didn't. Oh. And I and I left you guys on because you used my account. And uh, I come back about two hours later, and you're still going at it. You'd been talking for over, th what, three hours that night? Yeah, it was pretty close, I think. Like that. Maybe more. Maybe more. Maybe a tad over three. A little three. bit. Yeah. But, it, 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 you know, what's great about those conversations, and you, you guys have mentioned it, we have the kind of discussion you'd never have here. Because, it, you know, you, you, here you kind of have to watch what you're saying because it could come back to haunt you. Where if it's a private call, you can say anything you you feel, you know. Well, pretty so, much. So, uh, you know, Patrick always feels a little less inhibited uh, under that those circumstances than he does if he came on here, you know. He was always, yeah. when he'd come on here, he was always afraid that it would get people mad at him, you know. Yeah. But anyway, boy, it's Friday night and there's just the four of us. So it just be a busy night. night. Come on. Yeah. yeah. What was I? What I was going to say? Um, oh, did you see? Um, anybody here watch James Corden at all with the Late Late Show on CBS? Uh, no, I haven't seen it lately. He's had it since uh, 2015, and he announced uh, last night that he's quitting the show. He's going to uh, stop. Oh, yeah? He's he's going to quit in a year. Yeah. Well, you know, he's always had another career going. He was always very well known in England. He had hit series. Uh, he's been in major motion pictures like uh, Into the Woods um, as a singer. And he uh, he's a very talented guy. And to do that show every night kind of limits your options, you know? Yeah. So he just said, it's time for me to, this was a big adventure for me. Now it's time for me to go out and have another adventure. So. And he says, I also want to quit before people get tired of me. You know, which probably a good move. It would be yeah, Jimmy <laughs> Fallon should take that kind of advice, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I like what you and Phil were talking about that Alan wasn't invited to the Monday show. That was cute on Wednesday night. You thought that was cute? Why do you think that was cute? It's true. Well, yeah, I <laughs> I know, but I told you before I'm not up that early, so the, the you have a, like a 99% chance I won't be on the show. Well, I mean, if you called it, I probably yeah. wouldn't put you on. That's okay. I yeah. listen to it afterwards. Sometimes mm -hmm. they have interesting things to say. You know, Phil knows. Andrew that. Deutsch is funny. I get some material from him. Actually, Andrew hasn't called the show in months. 
No, well. So you, that's why you haven't had material lately. I see. Okay. Uh, Good. You know. No, Andrew did, I think, one day. He has some kind of job during the day now that takes him away from us. But we really, really enjoyed his, his presence on that show. Sure. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, don't feel bad. I mean, uh, Phil isn't welcome on that show either. <laughs> so, you know. you know. Oh, Tony's driving me nuts. Oh, yeah. Now, Tony... Here's Look at this PSA shit. Am I going to die? Am I going to die? You know, am I okay? Come on. You know no. something? I, I He got uh, the first guy to get this from Tony. Tony got a bad PSA test. And then he went and he got another one that was better than the one before it. Okay? Anyway. His doctor now wants to do a biopsy. Now, this is something you kind of have to be careful about. You know, sure. you don't just do a biopsy for the sake of doing a biopsy. Right, Phil? Right, Phil? What? I, I didn't hear Oh, I, you, you don't do We're a biopsy for the sake of doing biopsy. a biopsy. Oh, you know. uh, oh, okay. Wait a minute. Uh, you, uh, you know, I turn off the, uh, uh, the, uh, the browser so I, you know, you don't hear those last few minutes. Yeah. What about the bra well, I, we're talking, wait, you've, you've gotten calls from Tony in the last couple of days, haven't you? Every day. Every day. Yeah. No. And, and if I hang up on him, he calls oh, back. Oh, okay. So anyway, he gets <laughs> he gets a bad PSA test. It's a little high. And the PSA is the test they give you to see maybe where you, if you have a possibility of of, uh, of uh, uh, prostate cancer. I almost said breast cancer. Uh, prostate cancer. And um, uh, so he he got a little high test. So then they give him another test, and it was down. Okay. So I get a call from Shecky because first guy he calls the the first guy in the loop is Shecky. All right. And he says, "Could you know? Could you do something about Tony? He's calling me. Every, he's calling me and messaging me every five minutes about this uh, prostate thing." Well, you know, if a guy's got a prop, so I said to him, look, give him my number, tell him to call me, I'll calm him down, all right? So he calls me, uh, and I said, T uh, Tony, look, here's the situation. You probably should go get another opinion, because I think this guy's going too fast for a biopsy. Same thing I said. Yeah. And you went to a second opinion, right? I got a right. second opinion. Too. Yeah, you got a second I told opinion too. Call your guy and get the same test you got, which I don't know what the name of it. I don't was. know what it was called, but it's it's a test they do when they do the PSA. It's another blood test they can do that mm -hmm. looks into the possibility that you might have a Gleason score six or above. All right. Uh, total and, PSA? And, no, no. I, I told you the other day it isn't total oh, PSA. Okay. Total and, PSA. And it's not free. <laughs> no, but it's uh, uh, it's another test. I can't remember what the name of it is. Next time I see him, I'll I'll ask him uh, yeah. what it was called because uh, might be dead by then, uh, Tony. There. You well, know. anyway, I told him give my guy a call, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he supposedly called my guy, and they don't take his insurance. So go get so pay out of pocket and get a second opinion. Get a second somebody. opinion. Uh, I I don't know what kind of insurance could he have that you know. It, it's some New York insurance, and um, he told me em Emblem Emblem Health. Emblem, yeah, should, like he that. should. I bet. I, bet. I yeah. think it's a reasonable company. Yeah, I think he would. But, I think my doctor would take Emblem. Well, Absolutely. I think the level mm -hmm. of Emblem that he has is, uh, uh, if you're found on a sidewalk, they hose you onto onto the other side. No, of the they street. they hose the pavement down. Right. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't need insurance for that. But no, you'd be surprised. The city could charge you back. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so here is here's the thing. So I, I told him, look, call my doctor. Uh, I said, don't rush into this thing. You know, I said, I, I, I know you have a urologist that your doctor sent you to, but I, I said, between you and me, I don't trust urologists much, except mine. The one I found is terrific, right? And he'll do right by you. He won't do more than you got to do. He won't rush into a biopsy. In fact, he said to me, he said, look, most doctors rush into a biopsy because it's an easy $500. Sure. 
Sure. You know, and he said, I just don't do that. He said, that's not something I'm prone to do. He says, if I think there's a possibility. So I, when I got that Gleason thing back, you know, uh, yeah. the, Jackie, you the Jackie Gleason score <laughs> to yeah. the moon. Uh, and uh, I did that. Uh, he said, I think we better do a, 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 what do you call it, a biopsy. And he did the biopsy and we found the cancer. Okay, right. so that's it. Yeah. So I said, go to this guy. Now, Tony, one other thing he said, what? I said, do not call me again. <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. Yeah, he's calling Phil and me. Now he's, but it's, you know what he is? It's like a balloon where you push on one side and the, 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 it, it comes pops out, out, the pops other, out yeah. on the other. Yeah, that's what him. I, so I told him, don't call me. So now, since I guess he can't go to my doctor for some reason, I don't know, it's ins I can't, emblem insurance is something they take, I know. I think yeah, I, uh, I think he said that the, his level of emblem uh, was uh, if, if you're homeless, you get a better level. <laughs> you know? Oh, really? Oh, God. Well, anyway, anyway. But, you know, I guess maybe it's just for catastrophic. So now stuff. he's calling you guys. Uh, and, and, you know, you're not going to. You, you, know, you know what he wants? He, he wants somebody to say, oh, Tony, it'll be all right. No, but that's what I said. Little Tony, don't you worry. You know, he, he's looking for sympathy. No, but he got it early. Yeah, but he wants but more. The, 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 the <laughs> thing is with prostate cancer is if he's got it and if they treat it, it's very treatable early. I wouldn't want to have it either. But, you know, I'd rather hey. have it treated than have it go throughout your body and kill you. Well, like in, in, takes... in, 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 in uh, Phil's case, he had the prostate removed, and, of course, they threw it on the pavement and then hosed it down. So. <laughs> I would have been lucky the if they did the that. Sidewalk. Maybe they would have gotten the rest of the cancer. But, hmm. uh, the uh, you know, the deal deal with Tony is, uh, you know, his, his PSA is normal pretty much well you know energy. it went up it went up and he, but now it's back down below the 40 which is the you know the point well, he, he, he could have statistically had, all the same four and then three nine and three eight the, yeah the lab is not perfect on these blood tests and, and he could have had prostatitis or something yeah, let me say to, let me say to people who are listening to us right now PSA test is not a positive indicator that you have cancer it's only an indicator there might be a chance that you do yeah. And and so therefore, other tests are then indicated to find out. One of which well, you know is, of course, PSA a, a biopsy. For, right? You know what PSA stands for? What? Pretty sure about it. Yeah. I see. <laughs> so okay. you, you know that the test was originally developed to monitor people that had active cancer, and then they started using it to say, "Oh, maybe you do, maybe you don't." And they came up with some other tests. And it's a there's a lot of test. there's a lot of controversy around the test. Right. Okay. Right. Anyway, so uh, do you mind, uh, Kevin and, and Josh, if we give uh, Tony your phone number? <laughs> they probably blocked them a long time ago. You know, uh, oh, I, oh, okay. I know neither of you have had prostate problems, but, you know. But they want oh, to. No, 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 no. Oh, wait a minute. Have you? What? What? What, Kevin? He's looking for his prostate. What, is that a PSA test? A whole bunch of tests. I just got them the other day. Really? What do you got? Never mind. <laughs> What's your PSA? It's flight 23. Out <laughs> of San Francisco or Monterey? Uh, okay. Like then the only one here who hasn't had prostate problems is Josh. Right, Josh? Or as I know. How many times Give a night do you, get, do you get up to pee? Depends on how drunk I got, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, sure. this is something, excuse me, folks, but this is something that as you get older, all of you are going to, all you guys are going to have to face. Okay? Yeah, so are, it's I just, mean, it's an inevitable. Like, what? How old is Tony? 50, 52? Yeah. That. I mean, when it all starts. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's hey, it. You know? You, you know what happened to me is, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about me. I don't want to talk about Tony. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, talk about Phil. He's much more oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm more, I'm more interesting. My diseases are better than his diseases. 
so I, I get a floater uh, the other day. Oh yeah, flo- and, you know, I, always, I always thought a well, floater. Well, was no. What like, happens is what you do is you got if you get a floater flush. Yeah, well, no. Well, I thought a floater was some body in the bay, you it know, <laughs> that, that, yeah. you know, got dumped by the mafia. Yeah. Too but, much fat uh, in your diet. Yeah, it's what? Too much fat in your diet when you look in there and there's a floater. It's got to sink. Yeah, really. I hope it sinks. It's pretty big. And, <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, so the floater was uh, in your eye. Yeah, there's there's some uh, as you age. You, you get floaters, and uh, maybe it's from not getting enough sleep. They, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Could be but, certain uh, vitamin deficiency. Probably, the, probably gunpowder flashing. Yeah, well, a eye. little a little part of the eye uh, peels off, and it and it just floats around in there. And eventually, gravity it's it settles down. There really isn't anything they can do about it. But the symptoms that you get, which is these flashes that you know, that were going across my eye, almost like a comet. Mm-hmm. And uh, they thought that there's a possibility I could have had a uh, separated or a torn retina. Uh, uh, yeah. And so they Detached wanted retina. me immediately uh, to, you know, because I, I called and a couple days later they had a telephone conference. And, uh, and as soon as I explained the symptoms, the doctor on the telephone says, come right down. Uh, so I canceled my afternoon appointment and uh, went right down and they dilated my eyes and looked in there okay. and they said no the retina is okay it's just um uh it's just a floater so yeah. uh, but it's it's scary and it's uncomfortable and if, especially if you think you're going to lose your vision and yeah, that's and that's when they discovered your breast cancer <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh well you know I, I, my eyes are pretty important to me uh, you know for mm. some of the things that i do yeah. And uh, especially my it was my right eye, which is my dominant eye. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for shooting, you got to have your dominant eye. And for photography, I guess I could get away with, uh, you know, using my left eye. But uh, I, I prefer to use the right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let me see here. What, what's happening uh, news wise? Well, our president wants thirty three billion dollars to go to Ukraine. I'm sure the uh, Josh, Josh, how much will he get back? Yeah, as a kickback. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll get back. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Josh, is this not in a way us fighting that war over there by proxy? Well, it's developing into that. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't I mean, we just take that money and go over yeah. there ourselves and wipe Putin's ass all over the map? Well, I mean, I think that that's kind of our goal and what we'd like to do but i think that the politicians you know and i understand this uh, you know don't want any american life lost you know i mean the first american soldier that gets killed i think they have all this fear that you know americans will lose their mind over it or something like that and Mm -hmm. then everyone will start to worry it's going to get out of control and be involved in another war so i think They've just decided that since the Ukrainians are willing to do the shooting and the dying, not that they have much choice, that they will allow them to continue to do that and then support them. So, I mean, that's at least a good step in the right direction. Um, you know, it's they've, they're starting to step up the, the uh, support for them. I mean, Russia appears to be struggling still continually and... You know, I heard a lot of talk this morning about, you know, the Finns and the Swedes wanting to join, you know, NATO, um, which will aggravate the Russians more. But I don't know that they're in a position to do much about it. But, you know, what happened is Putin made this threat the other day that anybody that helps uh, uh, Ukraine uh, is going to have to pay a price. You know, I mean, it's, it's it's his idle threats again. He's right about about thirty three right billion dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I mean, is that not a reason for him to then unleash? He says, "I have weapons you don't even know about." Oh well, yeah. I what mean, really we'll tenacious? Mm-hmm. What really tenacious farts? What? What's his special yeah. well, weapon? We've got weapons he knows about. So that's right. Like Tony's <laughs> phone number. Yes, give him Tony's phone Tony's number. Number. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know the. I understand the... And by the way, you know, if you're listening, Tony, we love you. Yes, go ahead. There's always been this this argument, and it's a decent one, that 
the more that you expand NATO, um, you know, the more Russia will feel threatened because they slowly but surely feel like where they think that they're being, you know, pushed further and further into a corner and they're going to be surrounded by no one. But NATO countries who have this tight knit relationship to defend each other from any aggressor, mainly Russia. And I get it. But look, but they did that to themselves. If they don't want that, then they should stop acting like, you know, dickheads. So, um, you know, I, I understand that that that's their line of thinking. But to me, in my opinion, any politician in this country who who pushes that line of rhetoric um, as a reason that we shouldn't do things is a Russian sympathizer or is on their payroll. And if you're a sympathizer of them, well, that's your opinion. I just happen to disagree with it. So we'll go on about our our way. And if you're on their payroll, then you're a traitor. (laughs) So uh, you're a, a, a treasonous actor. I mean, but. You know, the, I mean, we're getting more and more, you know, involved and we had to pick a side and we did. So hopefully it's working out. I mean, we're uh, getting in pretty deep. I mean, $30 billion is a lot of money on top of the, you know, like 10 or 12 that we've already sent. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of weaponry and uh, a a lot of aid, but I think probably the right move i mean you know the the truman doctrine that worked for a long time was to contain russian aggression soviet aggression anywhere that you could find it you know um outside of their own borders of course. they have, you know, to, they, have think, to see, they have to corner off that southwest corner otherwise they're they're going to be screwed they'll be landlocked yeah and that's that's what i think they're going after right i know yeah, but the Ukrainians are hitting inside Russia now. Uh, they hit, a couple yeah, they hit on once. military bases yesterday or something like oh, that. Oh, yesterday? Uh, no, I think a, a couple of weeks ago they hit a um, uh, 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 oil, uh, fuel what fuel, fuel, yeah, fuel. they hit a, like an oil refinery or something. Yeah. 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 Hey, look, you know, that's that's fair uh, fair play in a war, you know, so... Um, well, if you're if the troops that are fighting you are getting their oil and getting their fuel right. from one of those yeah. plants, then it's fair game to go across the border and take it out. Yeah, you know, and then the Russians are making war on you know the uh, the, the the population, the citizenry. You know, what what uh, military historians or, or or whatnot would would sort of refer to as total war where war is being made upon the civilian population, not just the military apparatus of a, you know, mm-hmm. combatant nation. So, I mean, again, anyone that feels, you know, sorry for the Russians, they've done this to themselves. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're going to turn themselves here if they are not careful into the, North Koreans are going to be isolated. I mean, they're going to be more advanced, of course, but I'm just saying they're going to be isolated, you know, militarily and economically Mm -hmm. um, from the rest of the world. Travel is going to be cut off. No diplomatic relations. I mean, that's the road they're going down. I mean, you know, I mean, the the Germans I heard this morning are finally on board with banning all of their oil and gas. Um, They were sort of the last holdout, but apparently they're working pretty hard to find replacement oil. And if if everybody just stops buying it, that's that's the only money that, from my understanding, that they have left to fund their war making machine. So, you know that that's eventually that's going to cripple them. Um, so I don't know how they're going to continue. I mean, it you know the Ukrainians would like to end the war as soon as possible, I'm sure, but they just have to stay in the yeah. they just have to stay in the fight. I mean, any war of occupation. Um, which is what the Russians have gotten themselves involved in, comes with these problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't believe that they didn't realize it. I mean, I don't know if it's arrogance, stupidity, uh, you you know, ego. I don't know, a combination of three, I suppose. But whatever it is, it, it wasn't a wise move. And I can't sort of help but laugh, you know, that Putin thought he was the 
the going to be Russia's you know greatest leader of all time. It's it's almost starting to look like he's going to well, be there. Well, you know, it, you got a situation. Why aren't you? Why don't you go back to your other camera, Phil? It was web webcam settings. I was fooling around with it. Well, nice. well, well you shouldn't do that while we're doing a show. Uh, yeah, shame on you, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. He has green yeah. hair and then a red face. It's cute. Uh, I was trying to fix it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's something that we we should deal with here. I mean, uh, you know, I agree with Biden when he said in his speech that if we don't stop him here, you know, no telling where it's going to go from here. And that's been in history, dictators like this have taken a, a, a non fighting on the part of other countries or non intervention by other countries as a weakness. And this is what mm -hmm. he's going to do. And we need to teach him, hey, we're not going to stand by and do nothing. So now our part of doing nothing is what? Doing nothing but sending money. Fighting the war yeah, by I mean, proxy. We're, we're really, you know, we're arming the uh, Ukrainian military pretty well, I guess, you know, from what I hear. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're slowly but surely, like one little step at a time, ratcheting up. The, the pressure through our rhetoric and stuff like well, that. Well, here's, and, let me ask well, you this question. Let me that. ask you this question. This was something I was thinking about tonight, and I don't know that anybody's really brought this up. The question is, why is Putin so stupid and so bold? Okay? <laughs> and I think the answer lies in a very simple reason. He's got Parkinson's, and I think he sees his... Um, uh, his uh, his health and his uh, future limited, and I think he wants to make his mark on this planet before he goes. And I think he has no reason not to go all the way with this, because he's not going to be around to see the you know the resolution of it. Does that make I'd sense? I never. Well, it's known that he has Parkinson's. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even know that. But yeah. is it? But yes, I mean, it, it is. He's he's said as much. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't know. I mean, uh, but I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, the the psychoanalyzation, you know, that'll go on about why he's uh, doing what he's doing. You know, I'm sure is going to go on for quite a while and probably really never be settled. But the mark that he's leaving right now is pretty negative. I mean, uh, I know, but but like, can't, but he he's taking you know, he's taking every chance he can. He's just pushing it because he doesn't care. He he figures yeah. his time is limited, and so he's going to go for broke. If he knew that his Fair life, boss. if he knew that he was in good health and he had to live with the rest of the world for a long period of time, I don't think he would be this bold. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's sure it's possible. very possible. I mean, you know, it's uh, yeah. I mean, he's it's just like I say, you know, it was it's just sort of incredible that. Uh, you know, I don't know if he thought or the folks around him or whatever, you know, thought it was going to be this master stroke and they were going to roll in and sort of, you know, blitzkrieg them or whatever and, you know, start slowly taking all this territory back. And, you know, he was just going to ascend to this, you know, hero of the Soviet Union, the Russian people, whatever you want to call them now. And yeah. it's, um, I mean, they're, unless something changes, it's, it's, going in the exact opposite direction. I think I what mean, we're dealing with is a man who is trying to establish his legacy. Yeah. Because he knows his time is limited. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. that's a plausible scenario. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's not working out so well. I wonder right. why the news doesn't pick up on that, because I've never heard that. Oh, no, there was a news item uh, about... Maybe five hmm. months ago, something like that. That, that yeah, he, had, never heard he that. announced that he had Parkinson's. I, I, I yeah. Huh. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that's no. what Jeff. I thought that he started this little miniature war, which was almost like an experiment war, and he thought, whatever I'm going to do, I'll send my guys down there. They'll hmm. scare the shit out of them, and we'll we'll run that company. That country and it'll be part of Russia. Yeah, right. And you know what? It didn't happen. Right. <laughs> it pissed him off, and now he doesn't know what the hell to do to get to to be embarrassed. Yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm looking here to see about the uh, Vladimir Putin. There's a lot of stuff online about Parkinson's and, and uh. Uh, Putin with Parkinson's. And it, a, a lot of them are people looking at videos and seeing that he has something, you know, that he's not well. If you look at him, he he's very... What's the word I'm looking for? He's kind of... Uh, he's just not very animated. Okay, I guess that's the best way I can put it. You know. So. Well, yeah, I never heard that. I mean, it, you know, but it's it's possible. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the whole thing is just sort of crazy. But I, I mean, we'll see. You know, we'll see where it develops. I mean, you know, the the one thing that I sort of wonder about is, you know, now they're threatening these moves into you know like Moldova and places like that you know, countries that are NATO alliance protected, mm -hmm. you know, that are members and, you know, our president, you know, who really I would see as the de facto leader of NATO has said, you know, we will defend every square inch of NATO turf, you know, if, if they step one foot into NATO territory, we're involved, you know, so uh, what's gonna happen if that happens? Now, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know that that they're not even worried about that at all because they they really just see that as a you know a, a running off of the mouth as an idle threat that 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 sort of move will spread them so thin that they will be incredibly vulnerable um and even the stupidest of people wouldn't try it but it can still happen you know so i, I don't know i mean that would be you know because you can't really say something like that you know and then not really come through on it i mean i you know obama did in syria remember with the you know if you use chemical weapons that's a that's a red line and then you know they use chemical weapons and we were like well i said that what i don't remember saying that <laughs> yeah yeah we, do, we didn't do anything so you know but with something like nato i don't i don't know that you can do that you know i mean of course in that case it's not just going to be it's not as if that's going to happen and then all you know it's going to be all american troops i mean it would be a nato an allied force but you know that's not something they want to get involved in either because i have seen the numbers on nato versus the russian army and i mean nato as a whole versus the russian army and this is why the russians feel so threatened is the numbers just dwarf them i mean the Russian Navy is made up of something like a hundred ships, and, and the NATO Navy is made up well, of like thousands. after the after the other day, ninety nine ships. Yeah, well, they, uh, someone else made that joke this morning too. I heard which, you know, <laughs> that's one less now. I mean, the, the manpower is and like one more submarine. Yeah. To one. I mean, it. Yeah, it's just <laughs> you know, I mean, aircraft, tanks, armored vehicles. I mean, the numbers are just incredible. Um. You know, and, and you know, and the the will to fight among the Russian soldiery, I, I don't know what it is, but I keep hearing that it's not great, you know, and that, and look, the further down the line that you go and the longer that the war goes and you start getting into people who have been pressed into service via a draft or due to, uh, you know, uh, from a totalitarian government, from threats to their families or whatever, Mm -hmm. this Stalin-esque type movement, those people aren't really motivated. I mean, they may show up and all that because they said they had to, but I don't, they're not in the fight, you know? Well, you know, it's it's the same conundrum that we were in in Vietnam. The reason we lost right. Vietnam was because it's not our country, Yeah. you know? And the people all who right. are there have more of a reason to fight and they have a, a, a reason to win than we do to want to win. We just want to go home. Yeah. There wasn't a Russian soldier that was there that wanted to be there. You know, Phil, you having yeah. troubles? Yeah. Why? What, what did you do? Uh, webcam settings died. Uh, I'm going to have to reinstall it. So well, how do you know it died? Uh, because I can't open it. Oh, you can't open it. I see. Well, that that'll teach you to keep uh, to fool around. While yeah, we're on the really. air here, yeah, you want me to get off and I'll, uh, you know. No, no, you're fine. You're just very tiny and small. 
So just the way, <laughs> no, just the way, we, and keep trying to fix it because it does. It made you shut up. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you know the other thing that I think, and you'll probably agree with this, Josh, is historically the Russians have a mindset about being surrounded by enemies or being uh, subject to worrying about NATO as an example because we can go back to Napoleon you know uh, Napoleon well Napoleon went into Russia but he was pushed out of Russia because it was too cold for him no matter what kind of heavy jackets he was wearing but then we got to the the, uh, the, the Germany during World War II and what they did to Stalingrad and so on and again there's this history of other countries coming in and trying to give them, you know, to, to o overtake them. So they look at NATO in the same way. They don't see NATO as something any different than, say, the, the Nazi army. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just yeah. another army that's trying to take over what they got. Yeah, they, they certainly have this ingrained, you know, paranoia about basically being surrounded and cut off by everyone else, which in some ways is ironic for a country that has the the huge land mass that they that they possess. But again, but but they've done that to themselves. I mean, if they wouldn't act like assholes, you know, I mean, China's huge too, you know. But we're openly. I mean, I understand we have a tense relationship with them, but. We still unload boatloads of our goods in their country every day, and we unload ten times that many boatloads of their goods in our country every day. Yeah. So if they, they would don't just go around poking the bear either. Right. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So if they would just have acted, you know, like decent people for the last, you know, fifty years or whatever, mm -hmm. they wouldn't mm -hmm. be in this position. But leaders like Putin have just continued to take them down that path and they they haven't done anything to stop it. I'm not necessarily talking about the Russian people. I mean, their electorate doesn't really have much say in it, you know, but they also haven't really done anything to, to check it either. I mean, I understand that their elections are fixed and that they're in a system of government where that's not an easy thing, but you know, they're, there's not a large enough push for revolution or whatever there either. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not saying that's easy either. You know, you know, it's not me that would have to do it. So it, it, I'm sure that sounds like I'm spending other people's monies and lives. I, I mean, I get that. I'm just saying, you know, they're right. the ones that created this situation, this need for the world to treat them the way they are. But, but I guess overall what I'm s sort of seeing, and it's uh, kind of interesting because, I was listening to this podcast interview the other day about the Truman presidency mm -hmm. and it was sort of relevant, you know, because after the second world war, you know, when Churchill came to America and, and gave his iron curtain speech, you know, that made the, the phrase famous, mm -hmm. uh, Truman was, you know, in agreement with him on that, even though it really upset Joseph Stalin and Truman tried to make some peace with Stalin but he was so offended, you know, by the fact that Truman applauded at the end of that speech and all that kind of stuff. But but that's how Truman felt. Truman did not trust the Soviets. He knew that this is the path they would go down. That's exactly what happened. And he decided that, you know, he would institute a doctrine of containment, that he would allow them or not allow them, but in his opinion, you know, what territory they had was theirs. That's fine and good. We're not going to hash out the past, mm -hmm. but going forward, we can't have you just deciding that you'd like to have this neighboring country. Mm. And if you do, we're going to have to do something about it. And that worked for a long time. Okay. And it seems like we're, we're back to that. Let me bring up another old way. Let me bring up another subject here. I don't know how many of you saw this in the news tonight. But they got rid of the, uh, he's not the CEO of Disney, but they got rid of the uh, chief operating officer or something like that at Disney. The guy's been making all these decisions in Florida, and they mm -hmm. feel that he's really bungled the job because it's been Disney's feeling over the years that they keep out of political things. Uh, 
because they're a family business and they just want to be known as a family business and they don't want to get into other people's fights. And somehow, this time, Disney got into a real fight. And so they fired the guy who was doing all of this because they feel just, he just handled it badly. He handled it badly when people were arguing, well, aren't you going to do something about the, uh, uh, the no, don't say gay thing? And then when he did something about the don't say gay thing, which made all the uh, gay employees of Disney very happy and all the people who would go there uh, to have a magic weekend uh, 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 happy. Uh, but it, on the other hand, it then brought about the ire of the governor of the state of Florida, um, who is planning on running for president, so he looks upon this as a real opportunity to make news and to get in the press. Um, so we saw the head of the, he's not the head of Disney, he's not the CEO, but he, and I, I was looking for the title, I didn't see the title here. Um, Chief Operating Officer. Chief Operating Officer, something like that. Not the, maybe the COO, not the CEO, uh, but the, uh, the uh, uh, Board of Directors had him step down today. So that's the big news on that front. You know, if Disney were to decide, I'm sure that they could get, you know, what's been done to them overturned and probably come out ahead. And, and, you know, I don't really haven't heard many people discuss this. And, and so with what I'll say, this is nothing to do with whether or not Disney should have gotten involved or anything like that. I have no opinion on that that I'm giving. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that the law would be on their side, okay? Mm -hmm. Because under Citizens United, mm -hmm. that conservatives supposedly love, or at least Republicans loved, okay, and thought was the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. It was decided by our Supreme Court that the law of the land was that corporations had the right to free expression and freedom of speech, the same as individuals, and that the government, therefore, could do nothing to limit that speech uh, or or expression and take any punitive measure against any part of the uh, body electorate if they didn't like what someone did or what someone said. So they basically, under that law, under that ruling, are the same as you or I. Okay, if you or I, well, that said, goes back. I that goes back to a few years ago, where yeah, uh, so, where where the Supreme Court, I think, ruled years ago that corporations are individuals. Correct. And, so and, yeah, if if you or I said I don't like that law, the governor of Florida and their legislature could not make any sort of law that punished me for it, okay? But where the people in Florida really made their mistake was they openly said that the law was to punish the Disney Corporation. The, the, the governor said it many times. The leader of the, of the committee that wrote and, and pushed the bill through their state legislature said so on tape several times in the debate um what little debate there was etc so i mean they openly admitted that it was a punitive measure toward an individual mm -hmm. okay because that's mm -hmm. what disney is in this case they're an individual for their opinion basically i mean that it's just their opinion i mean they didn't take well action, here, here's the thing here's you know? the thing that that is kind of interesting i mean if we Let's for a moment take a look at the law that they passed in Florida, okay? It only applies to first, uh, kindergarten, first, second, and third grades. It does not apply to anything over that, okay? Is, is it that onerous to have passed that law about just not, and it's not don't say gay, it's just don't teach sexuality yeah. to those grades, that you can do it after that, but they not feel, before. They feel it's the parents' uh, right to, to do that and not the school. You know, when I was in first, second, and third grade, maybe not third, but cooties was the, uh, was, was the, it was the biggest deal you could have. And, <laughs> and so maybe kids of that age, uh, some parents may feel that 
showing or teaching them that individual stuff is is okay, but it's their right to do it. Well, and they I, don't I, want I, it done by the school. Well, I think that the school at some point should do it. But yeah, uh, maybe but, 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 eighth grade, well, sixth. No, well, you know. You, the, the, you know, but is it that horrible uh, a law that they passed saying that you're oh, just not but, yeah. uh, not supposed oh. to teach sexuality? No, uh, but it's it's uh, they're also teaching that uh, being uh, uh, born as a boy, but uh, it's okay to be a girl and and things like this. So uh, this I, is, I don't think this that's what's really. I don't think you see a lot of times uh, people like this, like DeSantis, come up with straw dogs. Okay, now I find me this find me the classroom uh, in first, second, and third grades where that's being taught right now in Florida. It ain't getting taught in Florida now. Well, no, no, but I mean, even prior to that, you probably won't find that they would be doing that you know, because I, I don't think that's the kind of thing they do at that age. I think. Did you did you see a, a thing called the libs of TikTok? I guess there was uh, this uh, person who put together a compilation of a copulation, compilation. Oh, uh, of all sorts of teacher. Hmm. Was it an oral copulation? <laughs> no, it's copulation. Oh, video copulation. Yeah. Video copulation. That would be porn. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so they, they put this together of uh, all of these uh, teachers who had posted uh, their own uh, stuff on TikTok, uh, talking about uh, sexuality and what they believe in and, and so forth. And then uh, there was a reporter that doxed the person who owned the site and uh, she was getting threats and things like that. Yeah, but, but wait a minute, wait a minute. This is on TikTok. What does that have to do with teaching these, in a school? These were teachers yes. that uh, uh, were expounding on their uh, 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 thoughts on sexuality and how it should be taught in the schools. Uh, are See, you I, mean, I, think, I think that at a certain point in schools, it's the school's job to tell kids about sexuality, and if the parent, but I say it's somewhere around maybe the fifth grade. If the parents haven't gotten around to it by then, then somebody's got to do it. I, I agree. Okay. Uh, uh, although, uh, and so what the law is is it's. Can but, but I don't know if this law in Florida is that egregious. It's not like. It, well, it, to begin with, they say it's don't say gay, but that's not really no, what that, it is. No, it has nothing to do with no, that. No, and that's and, just what people are are saying. It, yeah, I don't. I don't. You know, I don't. You know, personally, uh, you know, like for myself, know that the 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 law itself was you know like completely crazy or anything like that. And I don't know that Disney's reaction needed to be you know what it was or whatever. I, I don't know I'll, that I'll either I'll one you, of them yeah were necessary. You know, I'm just saying that if if I live in a housing development and when they build it, they said anybody that moves in that housing development gets a 10 percent discount on your property taxes so that you'll move in. And then I move in and it, me and everybody else are getting 10 percent off our property tax. OK. And my city council passes a law and I say, I don't like that law. That's a bullshit law. And then the city council comes together and they say, we are removing the 10% discount from Mr. Wheeler. Okay? They have violated my civil rights. Yeah. yeah. What There's is the, the difference between that and what they did to and Disney. what happened based on the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling of a decade? I, I guess they had the not ability, much. I guess they had the ability to do that. And from what I understand, Disney's on the hook for almost $2 billion in bonds. That that were uh, that, that was sold. So I well, but 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 what I'm saying is they they only think that they had the ability to do that. They had the ability to do that if they had done it in a generic fashion. But uh, where it was for Disney and all others or whatever under that same umbrella law, but they didn't. They did it for a specific individual. And I've heard several people already say. That okay. if they challenged it under those grounds, it'll take five years or whatever. I love this. But they'll win. I love this. Here, you know, the the left is always saying big business isn't paying their fair share. Big business isn't doing this and big business isn't doing that. Now, when big business gets slapped down by. But the, wait a minute, wait a minute, Phil, you're wrong. Business, you're, right. you're, but you're wrong, Phil. You're wrong. 
because it's not like Disney has not been doing their part. As a matter of fact, <coughs> Disney has a fire department, fire services for that for that area. They have a police uh, police for that area. They have ambulances, hospitals, all kinds of things that they've been paying for for years. Oh, I mean, and, I, look, and, I would just argue reason, that. And there's a good reason why. For instance, Richmond has Chevron Oil in there in in that in that city. Chevron has their own fire department, their own police department, mm -hmm. and, and and so forth. I mean, when you have a big business like well, that, what I'm saying, Phil, is that the the, the 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 idea of them being a community, their own community, uh, was said a long time ago because Disney Disney took that that place was swamp. Okay, nobody wanted that. Okay, he bought it. They bought it for like a dollar an acre. That's how much nobody wanted it. And they turned it into something. They turned it into something very profit-making for them and very, very uh, profit-making yeah, for the state of Florida. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying for anybody who's upset for that argument, I mean, you, you can't make it about me because I haven't been saying those things all the time for years and years. I, I'm saying if there's some hypocrisy on that side of it, well, that's fine. But the hypocrisy that I see in it is is from the, the Republican side who have said – well, yeah, businesses are corporations. They're entitled to their opinion and to give money to whoever they want. And then as soon as one of them did that in a public forum, they didn't like it, and then they punished them. So if they had if they had kept to their Citizens United mantra that they pushed for and that they have their own hand-picked Supreme Court in, in power now who will uphold that law, that's one of the ones they were worried about, as soon as one corporation came out and said something they didn't like, they punish them. The trouble is the Republican. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm telling you that when the government starts punishing Josh, people or corporations for things that they say, uh, Josh, equals fascism. What the I mean, I, I, Josh, what the problem is is that Republicans are Republicans until it affects them personally. You well, know, that's and fair. then forget all the all the all the conservative leanings that they have, and you know, Citizens United and all that other crap. Uh, all of a sudden, their tune changes. The, and, and I always said a Democrat's a Democrat until he gets mugged. Well, the the uh, the old uh, my old line about liberals is you know liberal is uh, um, uh, someone who uh, is, is is someone who's ten degrees to the left in good times and ten degrees to the right when it affects them personally. Right. You know, yeah. So whatever. But you know, I just that's that's how I see it. I mean, you know, if yeah, if I, right. I just. I see the hypocrisy there. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. corporations oh, apparently were people, but well, they didn't treat them like a person here. They didn't, they didn't, you know. Yeah. Yeah. At all. Yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, that's some of the stuff that's going on. We didn't even get to Oklahoma and their uh, abortion thing, but we'll, we'll get mm -hmm. to that some other time. We'll have to tweet about it. You will have to tweet about it. Right. Hey, listen, there's our theme song, uh, and uh, oh boy, it's been a good, good little show tonight, except for Phil trying to keep his... That's with my camera. Yeah, well, I mean, don't don't ever screw around with your camera while we're on the air. Have you learned yeah, your don't lesson? don't ever. That was horrible. Well, I, I, I kind of like it. My hair was turning green. I was trying to fix well, it. Well, we don't, you know, I don't, I never do anything before the show. Right, just before the show, because I know if I do, it's going to screw something up. But your hair doesn't turn green. <laughs> oh, I can make it turn green. You want to see? Anyway. Take your hat off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, my I, it actually I became more purple when I did red, that. Red, yeah. Yeah, more red or whatever. Hey, listen, that's it for tonight. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your, uh, your coming by and, and having our little happy fizzies party here, Alan and Josh and Kevin. And uh, Jeff, and of course, uh, the smallest guy on our panel tonight, Phil. Not very many callers tonight. Maybe eventually I'll get to the point where there's only one person calling, and it'll just be Josh and I. And then maybe later, halfway <laughs> in the show, Kevin will call, and it'll feel like Saturday night. Anyway, everybody, give yourself a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye as well as we say good night to our citizen panel. There they go, folks. And uh, uh, let me see here. Let me just do a little uh, little getting rid of them here. So that we can. Uh, Jack Bishop is next. He's here with the intersection. Yes, he's here with the intersection. The intersection is next. He's going to take your calls on Skype at GabNet Live 
We'll be back again on Monday on Facebook at 4 o'clock with our pop-up show. And you can also find that on YouTube after it's been done. We then post it over there as well. And in the meantime, we'll see you then again on Wednesday at 1030 for more of the ramble. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. Have a nice weekend.